Welcome to another episode of Getting Out of the Way with Daniel Resnick. We're going to talk about why it's so detrimental to our health to be a manipulated version of ourselves. Because as soon as I'm not living my authentic self, as soon as I'm not honoring that true essence of who I am, I am playing a role. And I'm playing a role because I feel I need to be heard a certain way or received a certain way. And so the more often I do that, the less I identify with that authenticity, the more I identify with role. And if I do it long enough, I start to believe that I am my role. And the more I role play, the more I forget about that true essence that is in harmony with things, that is in the flow of things, it has supreme guidance. It has no questions. It's full of answers. And it's been put away. And I can't figure out why I'm uncomfortable all the time. I can't figure out why I'm anxious. I can't figure out why I'm stressed. Everything should be fine right now, but something is just not letting me experience that truth. Only when we put the role down for a minute and we see our true nature, do we have that aha moment saying, oh my gosh, I got caught up playing a role. And this is who I really am. And then instantly I start thinking about, oh my gosh, I lost all these years. But in that awareness, I could reclaim the authenticity in this moment, and I never have to live a fabrication of it all moving forward ever again. But that requires integration. That requires me saying that I've made a mess of things. I have to clean it up. I have to shed the role. And I have to re-identify with my true nature. And the implications of that are so great sometimes that we don't want to do it. And even though we got the awareness, we don't want to integrate it. And that's why we have these conversations. That's why integration is key. If we can take a step back to yesterday, we had a profound experience, a lot of tough moments, a lot of insight. Our goal here is to discuss it, unpack it, and integrate it so that we don't veil our eyes again and go back to the role play. So lead in kind of where you wish. Whatever comes up, let's start there because that's probably most important and most appropriate. Yes. Yesterday was quite a difficult experience. Totally unexpected. I expected something completely different. It was definitely, as I told you after we were done, I considered it a rebirth, which you kind of, you took that idea. I don't know where to begin, but uh, I'll just say that, I mean, you were there, so you saw it all. And thank you for taking my abuse with such grace. <laughs> but I did think at the time that I was being manipulated for for greater good. And you you assured me that was not the case. I believe you. Having said that, the result of it was that that I like to look at myself as a truthful, honest person. Who doesn't? And in many ways, I have been truthful and honest, more so than um, others would be. And people have pointed that out. But I guess I've never gone all the way. And that's the lesson that I learned. Because I was kind of mad at you. Because I thought you, you deceived me. And it's interesting that I remember it all. But I told you, it's where you, why don't you just tell me the truth? And I think I ragged on the about that for quite a bit and then I realized that there's a positive side to that in that you didn't tell me the truth because you needed to teach me a lesson or it needed to teach me a lesson that uh, I cannot go around boasting about my own truth if I can't be truthful with myself. So in a nutshell, that was my experience. You started off with expectations Meaning it wasn't what I expected, you said. Right. Which is a huge topic for conversation because expectations lead to disappointments. Who are we to expect anything of this place we find ourselves in? Well, if you go to the store, you, 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 you pay for a dozen eggs, you expect to come home with a dozen eggs, you know, not, not oranges. You know, you just... And yet, if you come home 
and one of the eggs is cracked. You right. no longer have a dozen eggs, and right. then you get bent out of shape because I paid for a dozen eggs, and I <laughs> expected all 12. Right. Or you don't look at it, and literally there's 11 there. Maybe one wasn't cracked. And so, again, disappointed. And so with expectations, like a coin toss, it could come out either way. Yeah. But that's what I'm trying to say. There are useful expectations, and there are expectations that are not useful. This I say useful, all of them are useful. This was a useful expectation. I, I, I say all of them are useful. No, a cracked egg is not a useful expectation. There should be a dozen eggs in the, in the carton. Right. But when there aren't, I'm disappointed. Right. And so the expectation is a possibility that leaves room for chance. And when there's chance, it could go this way and it could go that way. But if I only... I'm going to feel okay if it goes my way, according to my expectations. Every time life goes against my expectations, who bears the brunt of it? I do. Because I wanted it this way. Even if I've been accustomed to having it this way. Don't you think that people that reach their their goals in life is because they've set set out certain expectations and they've met those expectations because they worked towards a goal. If they wouldn't have that expectation, they wouldn't have achieved. It's hard for me to talk about others when they're not representing themselves, but here you and I find ourselves in dialogue. Right. So you want to tell me about some of your expectations that didn't go your way, that left you upset like yesterday? You came into a situation with a certain set of expectations based on what? Based on previous experiences... And based on those previous experiences, you colored a narrative of a future that looked exactly like the past. And who wants to do this? The idea is the mind doesn't like unpredictability. And so when the mind wanders off into the future, it sees gaps in logic because it can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. But it's very concerned with this because it might not go my way. Because tomorrow might not be how I expected it. And so what it does is it fills in some of these blanks in logic with past experiences because that's all it has to work with. And so it starts filling in a version of tomorrow that looks like a version of yesterday. But if it doesn't happen, I'm left holding the bag. I'm the one that's disappointed. Even though in that moment I might be getting exactly what I need. I'm not okay with it because it doesn't feel like yesterday because I needed this to be predictable. This is not a place of predictability. This is a place of truth. We don't get what we want in this space. We get what we need. And so you started to resist. Whether you recognize it or not. I'm not sure resist is the right word. Oh, it's absolutely the right word. (laughs) Because you started to resist the experience because what was coming to you, you were rejecting. You were rejecting it because it didn't look like what you wanted it to look like. And as soon as it looked different, you started to push it away saying, no, this isn't right. This isn't good for me. You lied to me. It should have been this way. Who said it should have been this way? Your narrative did. Your historic record did, which is the role play. Because who is that historic record? If you're going to define yourself by everything that happened yesterday, you can't be brand new today. How can you have this rebirth if you're busy holding on to what was? And so you come into experience holding on to what was, thinking that it should be this way. It's coming a little bit different. It's shaded differently. It's colored differently for your benefit, for your ultimate gain. But as soon as it feels off from what my expectations are, I start pushing it away, which is resistance. And resistance causes friction. You pushing up against Mother Nature creates a lot of friction and resistance because there's only one winner in that game. So you resist and resist and resist. And you say, no, it's this one. It's that one. It's the world. You manipulated me. You deceived me. You conspired against me. You lied to me. All of these things were evidence of resistance. And all I'm saying is just breathe, receive it, let it come. It will pass. This too shall pass every moment. The idea is if we're busy pushing it away, We can't get anything else because we're engaged with that one moment. And we're so engaged with that one moment, right, that the next moment is not happening. And I want it that way. Mother Nature's saying, no, it's going to rain today. 
you can fight all you want, but I'm reigning. Right. And either you're going to accept the reign and go dance in it, or you're going to get bent out of shape and get abused by it. And so it was resistance from the very first moment when you stepped out after about 30 minutes saying, are we done? And then I am hungry. I knew right there that you were in a place of resistance. I stepped inside with you, reminded you to breathe, turned on some music, gave you some banana. Right. Yeah. I said, hey, just breathe. Just breathe. I kept returning to the breath because the breath brings us to a state of acceptance because the breath takes us out of our mind, out of our expectations, and we experience what is. What is is that deep breath. What is is that happening. And to let whatever is appropriate for me to unfold and manifest for me, for my greater good. And so that's why we go back to the breath. And when we have a hard time breathing, we start over-identifying with the thoughts and the analysis and the judgment of the moment saying, this isn't good, I don't like this. And now you're caught. Now you're caught having an experience that you feel is inappropriate because it's running counter to your expectations. How do we let go of those expectations? Just come to the breath. And whatever is, is. Whatever will be, will be. The dude abides, yes? <laughs> Just like that t-shirt. So the idea is let it happen. Let it unfold. Don't judge it. Don't preclude it. Because you're basically saying, I don't like this chapter in the book. And because I don't like this chapter, I'm going to close the whole book. But you know, brilliant authors and directors, they set us up. If I want to tell a love story, I'll start with a, maybe a depressive story, something that makes you sad. Why? Because if I take you down, yeah, bring you up, right. I can bring you up. And so if I get caught up in that first chapter, in the first scene of the movie, and I say, nope, this isn't for me, the rest of it's not unfolding, but guess what? You bought the ticket, the movie's playing, you're in your seat, door's closed, you're not going anywhere. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the movie. Come back to your breath. Let the director show you the whole body of work before you try to evaluate it, judge it, or close your eyes to it. Life is going to do what it does. But if I think it needs to happen this way for this guy, maybe sometimes it's going to work out. Maybe sometimes it won't. But if I'm not okay with it going this way or that way, then I'm stuck. I made that clear that I was okay. Just describing the experience, but not totally okay. Now, hi. What's now, that? now, but it was very hard then. And who knows what we missed? Who knows what we missed because we got caught up in a moment of dislike. Because ah. mm. you might have only seen the first couple of chapters. Right. I don't know. That's for you to figure out. I'm here to help you do that. But ultimately, that's what happens. And we talked about it. We said the one thing we don't want to do is evaluate it or judge it in the moment. We said we want to take in the totality of data before we start to evaluate it and judge it because we don't want to get caught up in a moment because we said that all the thoughts come and go except for the ones that we hold on to. As soon as we hold on to a thought, the mind, which is an expansion ray of sorts, starts to expand that thought. It will mushroom, it will balloon. We talked about how businesses and other ideas get birthed into reality in this way. It comes in as a kernel of thought and we hold it in our mind and we play with it and play with it and it grows and it pops and it gets bigger and bigger until we, let's say, give life to it. And if I'm busy holding on to one thought, I'm precluding every other thought from coming down the pipe. And in fact, they're coming loud and hard and they're knocking on the door saying, let me in. And you're like, nope, nope, nope. I'm busy with this one because this one's heavy and ugly and scary. Wouldn't I want to face it? Wouldn't I want to be okay with it and saying, hey, this is counter to my expectations, but that's okay because I don't know what's going to come next. And maybe the next one is going to be a really light and beautiful one. And so we got caught up. And that is friction. That is resistance. And that is difficult. And that is painful. And that's what gets us writhing around, twisting and turning. And that's very heavy. I've been there many times. That's why in the conversation before, we're like, hey, just remember, breathe. Everything passes and focus on your intention. So um, talking about expectation and the expectations that I should have, 
and obviously this is something that you've explored and kind of has a, have a handle on. Um, what is your expectation? I have none. And if I catch myself with expectation, I see there's more work to do. Meaning, did you kind of know it probably would have gone in a certain direction? or you? To I was observing, and in real time, I was seeing the friction and the resistance, right. but I'm in no place to change anything. Right. So all I do is bring presence to the room of being okay with the moment, no matter what it is. Right. And I sit there with my eyes closed in meditation saying, this is okay. Right. This is unfolding in a divine and lawful way. And I am not in any position to want it this way or that way because then I will bring more friction to the room. I will bring more expectation. I will bring a lower disharmonious vibration to the room and that won't do you any good and that won't do me any good. So whichever way it unfolds, I'm okay. And if I notice myself saying, oh my gosh, I want him to have an experience this way or I want him to heal, Right away, that's my indicator that, ah, there's my work. What about this is uncomfortable for me? And so we both learn. We both have ceremony in that way. No expectations, brother. Because I've been disappointed so many times as a result of my own expectations, which I realize were framed by my narrative and my identity and my role that I want nothing to do with it. I think if you remember, I actually spoke, I mean, I think I alluded to that, my own expectations of others. So we're back to expectations. We're back to wanting a manipulated version of God's divine plan. And we create separation in this way. Meanwhile, he tells us in scripture, it's all one. I am one. And yet right away, I want it this way and that way, which means I am a separate I, separate from him in his unfolding, a lawful divine unfolding. And right away, there's conflict. So if I can't reconcile everything in oneness, I'm caught being an I, being a separate self. And there will be pain and suffering to follow, I assure you. So every time I get caught up in the he, she, teacher, student, right. and how can I bring that to this space? How can I bring that level of disharmony to this beautiful space? Whether you heal or you don't heal, that is on you. I'm by your side one way or the other without expectations. And sometimes suffering leads us to salvation. Oftentimes. It's just a very difficult way to get there. That's Jewish history 101. Ah, but this is some of the stuff that we're trying to demystify. Exile and we're trying to address some of the misinterpretations that are built in to our model of reality. And so... Now, I'm going back even further. I'm talking about the biblical... There was a purpose for for that suffering to happen. There's a purpose to it. Exactly. So how could I preclude you from your suffering when there might be a purpose to it? How could I want to take you off the path of suffering when perhaps it was divine and designed in a very specific way to get you exactly where you need to be right on time? And I'm saying, no, I know what's better. My expectation is he shouldn't suffer. And quick, let me pull you away from the suffering. As soon as I do that, I take you off the pathway that was designed and destined for you to bring you home to salvation, to oneness, for my own selfishness, because I don't want you to hurt. I hate people hurting. Oh, I didn't say I take pleasure in it. It hurts me tremendously, but I have enough compassion and love to be by your side throughout it where I will hurt with you. You think it was comfortable for me to see that yesterday? It was very uncomfortable. Why? It was uncomfortable. Because I had expectations to a degree ah. until I realized, oh boy, here I am again as a separate self with expectations. That reminds me, sit down, breathe, let it go. And then I find myself sitting and I find myself letting go and I find myself learning and I find myself growing. And to take a step back about having a hard time with people in pain, I have a younger brother. And my brother was going through a very difficult time in his life. And this was already when I was on my path to healing. And I was working with some of these tools, plant medicine, meditation, breath work, diet, sleep exercise, etc. I recognized that they were creating profound, they were allowing the natural change that was already occurring to manifest 
in an appropriate way where real change was taking hold within me and I felt better as a result. I was able to breathe better. I was able to feel better. I was able to interact in a more genuine way. I was able to start shedding my role and I was feeling lighter as a result of that. And I saw my brother going through this very hard time dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety, dealing with pharmaceutical solutions that were putting him further and further into a rut. And I was witnessing this. I wanted to take all the pain away. And so I would come to him and I would say, do this, use these tools, be like me. I wanted to pull him away from his suffering. Right. And the more I was pulling, right. the more I was creating separateness, the, was just a... the more he was falling deeper and deeper which means that possibly that was not a good idea to do that. Exactly. On your part. Exactly. So then how do we how do we get that person so, to the promised land, as it were? I let go of wanting a different way for him. I got to the point where I said, maybe the pain and suffering that he's going through is actually going to bring him to a turning point in his life. And I can't preclude him from that. I can't take him away from that, but I can be a brother. And being a brother means I love you, I am with you. I have compassion for you, but I don't want it my way. I don't want it any other way than the way it is. And I'm telling you, I'm going to be by your side for everything and anything. If you need me, I'm here for you. And I'll walk lockstep with you moving forward. But I'm not going to want it this way or that way. And when you're ready, if you want to turn to me, I'm happy to share anything with you. But ultimately, I have to work myself out. I have to do my process. And even though I see your pain, I don't know what the purpose of it is. But I trust that there is one. So have it your way, brother. But I'm right here with you. And what happens is how do we help these people, as you said, by being, by being in harmony with it all. And in that way, we change the world from the inside out. We keep doing our work and we keep getting into the flow of things and we keep dipping into the greater plan away from the narrative, away from the role, away from the expectations of wanting it this way or that way. And we create a harmonious condition within ourselves. And when my energy and vibration is flowing accordingly with the great way, then there's a quality of magnetism that starts to take hold and people feel it and people want to be near it and people gravitate to it and learn from it without a word being spoken whether they know or not and so eventually when someone has their fill of pain and suffering then they start looking for a way out and then I was right there already in my process where he was ready to say I am ready what do you got for me how did you do it? Because I've seen your change. And it only happened when I stopped resisting. Instead of me coming to him, he ended up coming to me. And that's just how it works. How's he doing? He's doing great. He's getting married. He's got a new place. He's got a beautiful job. He's feeling good. He's doing good. He's interacting. He's a part of the family. He's helping others. I mean, a true rebirth of the highest magnitude and still yet there's more work to do as he's identified but now that we touched on rebirth tell me what that looks and feels like because this is i mean how profound is it to be able to say that i've had a rebirth while still being in the same incarnation like i said to you um at the time the most important nugget of the day was the lesson which is a life lesson but as the hours wore on, then you start talk, thinking about details. Okay, how, how am I going to look at this detail? How am I going to look at that detail in my life? I'm, how am I going to parse it, you know? So one of the things I'm actually willing to discuss, if I would tell it to you, it would mean that someone who's close to me in my family, my extended family, wouldn't be hurt, but would be grossly offended by my talking about it. I mean, this amongst a lot of other things is really a great source of distress for me. Going, having gone through this now, I think I have a different take on it. And I'm actually starting to understand why others in my circle don't seem to have the same take as me. 
Sounds like a before and after scenario. So what was before? So, you know, involved in a project for an award that's in my, my daughter's memory. And we're, we're running into resistance from some of the schools because the schools are resisting an award that's honoring someone who took their life. And, uh, and this has been a great source of distress for me because these are the two main schools there and uh, they're not being included. And that, well, this has not been resolved, by the way, and they don't seem to have the same concerns that I have. They just say, you know, let's plow ahead. It's the point that they asked me to kind of, you know, you have these fundraising uh, uh, campaigns, teams, and I was at a fundraising campaign a couple of months ago. They did one a year ago. And through my contacts, through this, you know, the, the, this award, I was able to raise $50,000 last year, including matching donations. And this year, it went up. And I got to tell you that the more money we raised, the more anxious I got. Because I felt that I was not being true and honest to the people that are giving money, knowing we're not, we're not servicing this award as I had expected this award to be serviced. And then think about it, how can I be anxious about raising too much money. That's such, that should be a success thing, but no, because I'm feeling that, and I've told this to my wife, I said, we're taking money from people that uh, we're not delivering a product in return because we don't have access to all the, all the schools and institutions that we thought we, had, we would have had access to. We thought we would have access to. So yeah. again, it's, a, it's an expectation. Correct. So if we let that go, and if we live through our genuine self, we put our best foot forward, we put all of ourselves into the action. And so long as I put all of myself into it and I am authentic to it, they don't necessarily have an expectation of it should be this way or that way. And if they do, that's on them to work out their expectations. Well, it's been sold and marketed a certain, in a certain way. And, yet, and then you have to the, honor that's that. That's not the truth. We, but you, we can't. Well, no, 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 no. That's not up to you. All the secondary and tertiary dilemmas that you're identifying, right. they're just occurrences. They're actually not dilemmas at all. They're just occurrences. And they're unfolding in a very lawful way. My perspective, my localized perspective, just doesn't let me see it. My job is to be authentic. My job is to deliver my truth within this action to the best of my abilities and disconnect from it at that point and let the world do its job. What was my intention? My intention was to do this beautiful action. So do the beautiful action with all of yourself, but then disconnect from it. It's called involved detachment. I'm very involved for my piece of the puzzle. And then when I put it out into the world, I detach from it. And if it comes back to me, in that moment, I'll know what to do. But otherwise, it's for the universe to determine how it's going to be received by the others. Yeah, but there's, there's always a fear. Like the said to you yesterday, that's it's not come up to me. me. It's say, up to him, to his divine plan. Don't you lie to me. <laughs> the fear that you just touched on is based on an imagination of someone coming to you saying something, none of that is manifesting, you're drumming it up in your mind, what the mind receives as that input, it will respond to as if it is reality. And you will deal with the chemistry that corresponds to that false reality. It's not happening. It's me and you and these two microphones and the floor under our feet and the seats underneath us, and that's the reality of the moment. And if we're going to drum up some imaginary situation of somebody maybe coming to me, maybe saying this, and now I start to think about that, as we discussed before, you boot it up into the mind, it's an expansion rate, now it starts to grow. And now I really feel that guy's coming. And in fact, he's outside the door. And now I'm getting stressed as a result. Now I'm getting all of the chemistry associated with stress, which is cortisol, and my whole body is withering. And now I am tight and I can't breathe. And oh my gosh, the sky is falling. But meanwhile, here you and I are. It, the sun is shining and the two microphones are here. We're picking up all these silly words. Let go of expectations. Please, for your own sake, the theater of mind, which is looking at a potential future, which it can't solve for because it wants it predictable. But you want to, but you want to direct it, perhaps. Say again, I'm sorry? You may want to direct it. How old are your children? I have a soon-to-be 6-year-old and a soon-to-be 12-year-old okay, girl. So, you, so you're raising them. They're, they're children. 
If I get caught up in the wanting again, I am caught up in separation. I am caught up in desire systems and I am caught up in expectations. And if I take my kid to the playground and I don't want him to get hurt because I think it's going to be bad, then maybe I shouldn't take him to the playground. Is it that smart and sensible? No, I'm going to take him to the playground and whatever's going to happen, happens. Because if he falls and he skins his knee, I'm going to be right there for him. I'll pick him up, but I'm not going to stop him from playing because he skinned his knee once. I would not preclude him from the playground because I'm worried about the knee getting skinned. In fact, I know it's going to happen. So I'm okay with it because I know I'm going to be there. I mean, you're scratching the surface of... of, of Let's go deeper. When, when it comes to parenting, again, I asked you at children's age not to pry, but just to, just to start the conversation about... I got to believe that every father is, is a responsible father wants to direct, and, and that we, we often don't do it correctly, wisely, wants to direct their children's future according to the various systems that you, that, you, that you have adopted. Why would I want to direct them anywhere? Why do I think I know what's best? My parents thought they knew what's best, and they had great intention, but ultimately the execution wasn't there because they didn't have certain tools. Okay, so but you... they wanted to direct me. See, if, it, if my parents had it their way, I'd be a doctor or a lawyer. That was their way because that's what they felt was appropriate for their lives. And so I can't put my narrative on my kid because I want him to be a certain way. Because when I came up and said, I want to be an artist, no, 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 you can't be an artist. You won't make money. You have to be a doctor or a lawyer. Again, that's their narrative being imprinted and imposed onto me, which gets me in a very precarious position because now I'm thinking, wait a minute, but I have this natural thing that's coming through me and I want to express it with a paintbrush and colored pencils and you're telling me and I love you you're my custodian and I'm young and impressionable and you're telling me no that's inappropriate study this book I have a conflict of interest I have this natural thing coming out of me but someone I love who I think knows best is telling me no don't do that do it my way now what do I do as a young child which way do I go and I learned that for my upbringing, because I wanted to be an artist and consider myself one. Are you saying there's no line that can be crossed when, when it comes to parenting? That there's nothing that, that your children can do that w- won't disappoint you? What's funny is the more I let go of expectations, the more disappointments fade away. I don't know how my kids would disappoint me right now. I really don't. I swear. I don't know. You just had me question it in my mind. Like, what would my, either of my kids do now or in the future that would disappoint me? And I'm like, wow, blank. They just, you know, it's a sp- especially older one is before the teen years. And that's, uh, every, every father will tell you, as I've gone through it three times, that's a difficult, uh, Based on your story, dangerous. I respect that. But your story is not mine. So I'm just sharing my story I'm with not, you. I'm not, saying I'm that, that. I, I'm not, I don't want to, no, I don't want to place it on you, but I'm just saying that the, uh, So share, share from your but, perspective. So I don't think I've reached the, the mountain in terms of what you're talking about. I agree with you 100%. On the other hand, there's some heavy stuff that happened that you can't reconcile. That's the other hand. That's what no, I'm I've, I've, re- I've reconciled it. I've reconciled it. But I'm, as I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you and I'm saying... You're trying to accept it, but you haven't reconciled it in truth. You understand it intellectually, but you can't accept it in your heart. That's what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> That's what you're feeling, right? I'm telling you exactly what I'm feeling, yes. I don't know why, but that's a feeling in me. I expressed it to you. You do what you want with it. Find truth in it, dismiss it, it doesn't matter. It happened in me, it occurred in me, I expressed it, that's my truth. I'm not manipulating anything, I don't know why I said it, I don't know why I felt that way. It's how I feel. I can't have it inside. If I shut my mouth and I say, he's not going to like to hear this, let me hold on to it, now it's my problem because I'm caught holding something. And that's going to make me uncomfortable. And I can't have that. I have to be a clean and empty vessel, I have to let it all out. So it came up inside me, I let it out. I'm not doing it to offend you. I don't want it to be received any which way. It's just my truth. I hear you. Conceptually, it's a beautiful concept, but I'm sure you're going to agree with me that it's going to take a lot of work. And I'm here by your side. I, I cannot express how appreciative I'm of that. And I'm extremely appreciative of the fact that you share the most special moment with me and you share this dialogue with me and you share this space with me and you do so openly and honestly in sponsorship of healing. That means more to me than any outcome that I could possibly desire.